Thank you very much, David. Our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Judith Wolfe, who's going to talk to us about opportunities for the UK in tidal energy. Uh, and if Judith keeps to time as well as David does, there'll be a question for you at the end, David. Thanks, Judith. So I have to put this upside down. Hopefully, Hopefully then you can hear me. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I'm introducing myself as um, a member, still, just not quite retired yet, of the Marine Systems Modelling Group at the National Oceanography Centre. And I hope some of you will come up later and come and see us at the National Oceanography Centre lab in Liverpool, which is on Brownlow Street. Um, so, I'm also um, aff affiliated with the uh, School of Engineering at the University of Liverpool. Um, I'm not an engineer, I'm an oceanographer and a marine modeller, so there will be reference to some engineering and, and other disciplines which I'm not really qualified to uh, talk about a lot, so I will skim over some of those aspects, but I'm, I was asked to talk about opportunities for the UK in tidal energy. and. I hope to uh, answer that a little bit um, and possibly point out why we haven't actually built all these tidal power plants that would look like we, we should be in a position to build. So this is what I was going to talk about. I'm starting with something called the energy trilemma. I don't know whether you've heard about that. I'll explain it in a moment. And then looking at what is offshore and marine renewable energy. And then what, could it, what contribution could the UK tides make to renewable energy? And I'm going to move into my area of expertise to some extent, talking about computer models. I'm trying to avoid equations. And then looking at how we can use those models for the estimation of the <coughs> tidal energy resource and the environmental impacts, which are another big aspect of trying to harness the tides. And looking at then at the end, what are the outstanding challenges and what do we have to do? And then there's all these really difficult, messy things, politics, economics and engineering, which get in the way and are not something I'm going to talk about in any detail, but the reason why we haven't actually done, done all this stuff. So this is the energy trilemma. It is a balance between um, energy security, that means the UK can produce its own energy, that would be a good thing. Um, energy equity, it's got to be accessible to all the, the citizens and affordable and then also environmental sustainability. Really, we want all of those things in our energy supply. How is the UK doing? Um, do we need renewables to actually get our energy? Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this as being a good thing. And then how much of a role is there for offshore marine energy? Because obviously solar, for example, is, is a big one. It doesn't require us to use marine energy. First of all, the UK is fifth in the world for this balance of the energy trilemma. It gets a triple A status. Only eight countries in the world get that. We are number five, and the top three are uh, Sweden, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. So we're doing well in that sense. But there's another thing you can do, which I find really fun. If you want to look at this, it's on, if you have a smartphone, you can get an app called Grid Carbon. If you just search for on the, on the Google Play Store or whatever, you can find Grid Carbon. This is a snapshot from um, yesterday, I think, two days ago. And um, it was actually looking at what is the UK doing in terms of its, its supply of energy and how much carbon are we actually creating per kilowatt hour. So that's grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. It's updated every five minutes. So you can actually look at that on your phone and watch how it changes. And in the middle of the day, which is when this was done, you can see that gas is producing most of our energy, electricity, I should say, um, but wind, nuclear and solar are the next three, all of which are zero carbon. That's great. Um, and then we have biomass. That's also quite a good thing. Some of that's producing um, heat for, um, and, and then electricity from waste. And then we also get electricity coming from interconnectors, as they're called, from other countries in Europe. For example, the Netherlands, France, Belgium. We also have an Irish interconnector. And then, somewhere down there, we have hydro. Right. Hydro is where we're at now, we're talking about. But hydro mostly means generating electricity from rivers, from um, dams, um, so high, high, um, high range um, 
energy or, or low head, sorry, high head or low head, which is run of the river type hydropower plants. And they're mostly in Scotland, for example. Um, but in that, in that number, we could also count tiny, tiny amounts of um, marine energy, marine hydro, which would be tidal energy, for example. But we're not doing very much on that. Anyway, so what things could we class as offshore marine uh, renewable energy? This is the really big one. Offshore energy, but it's not from the sea. This is wind, offshore wind. But we have other things that could be done and are being done to some extent. So here we've got, um, this is the, the wind again, but we, on, in the middle we've got a tidal stream power plant that was in place in Strangford Lock for over 10 years. And then we have um, another type of tidal stream device. This is a, a famous and looked like a very promising way of getting wave energy. And this is called Polaris, but unfortunately that company's gone bust. And then this is a tidal range power plant at La Rance in northern France. We haven't got one in the UK, but they've been doing it in, the, in France for over 60 years. Anyway, if we go back to some numbers about where we stand in the, in the UK, we, there is a renewable energy directive which has come from Europe, and that's, I won't go into that B, B word thing, but anyway, we have signed up to this. There's a binding target for 20% of the final energy consumption to be from renewable sources by 2020, which is next year. How are we doing? Well, the UK target within that is 15% of our overall energy from renewables by 2020. We started from a very low level in the early 2000s, about 1.5%. We are doing hugely well. Um, we, the, the actual breakdown is that we need 30% of electricity coming from renewables. But the other two big things where we use energy are, are heat and transport. Um, and those 12% and 10% targets are actually very hard. We are, we are doing well with electricity, but we're likely to miss the other two. What about wave power? Um, there is a huge potential. We have large waves offshore, um, but it's actually a very challenging um, engineering challenge and trying to bring that energy ashore and, find, and making it um, really um, economically viable. If you remember, I do, early in my career, hearing about Salter's ducks in the 1970s, and that was the big promise of electricity from the sea. Still hasn't happened. We did get somewhere with Polaris, as I say. Unfortunately, that's failed. So we're still not really there for wave power. Wind power, we are doing fabulously well. We've got both um, offshore and onshore wind. We, are now, we now have 21 gigabyte, gigabytes, gigawatts, gigabytes, gigawatts <laughs> of deployed capacity. And eight gigawatts of that is offshore, and this is a, a, a monopile type arrangement where you have a, a big wind generator at the top, and it generates 8% of the UK electricity. As you can see on that grid carbon um, app, we are doing really well with wind. The thing about wind, though, is it doesn't blow all the time, and there's times when it's really cold, when it actually is very calm. Um, so it's not going to be the only solution. But we are actually doing really well in the UK. In 2009, we became the leading country for offshore installed wind capacity. Then we have, what could be done with tidal, tidal energy? Um, I'll come to about how much resource we have. It's been estimated from different studies that we could maybe get 5% of our electricity from tidal stream. That's where we put an object in the flow and uh, we, we let the, it's just like a wind, underwater wind turbine and we drive it with the flow past it and then we capture some electricity. Um, tidal barrages and possibly this other thing you will have heard about recently, um, tidal lagoons, we could get 15%, maybe 20%. There have been different estimates of how much electricity we could realistically generate. I was involved with one of these studies 10 years ago and um, Northwest England has particularly high tides and as we were hearing, um, but we also have the Severn Estuary, which has the second high, highest tidal range in the world. Well, we'll not count Canada, we'll call Canada one. Yes. So we've got Hudson Bay and the Bay of Fundy, but we're, we're sort of, you know, there's, there's, there's the Severn in, in the UK, and then we've got Liverpool, which is the second highest in the UK for tidal range. So we have got the resources. Uh, and of course, there's the opportunity to build a barrage on the Mersey, which could generate perhaps 0.3% of the power. I'm not going to argue numbers about this. There's, there's still studies going on about 
how much energy we could get from the Mersey. Um, this isn't a new idea. So when people have uh, seen flowing water for thousands of years, they thought, aha, we can do something with this. And in fact, um, this is one of the earliest tide mills. I can't do that with a pointer, but anyway, that's uh, Strangford Lock. Uh, again, so where this, where this recent um, um, uh, tidal stream device was placed, the sea gen, which was there from 2008 to 2017. But in, in the um, early medieval period, 619 around then, um, there was a, a tidal mill built on Strangford Lock, and um, it was, of course, used for grinding corn. So you have a wheel which was turned by the tidal flows going in and out, and then they ground the corn, which is obviously very useful at the time. And I've got, a, I think, done something wrong. It's a little pen one. The wrong pointer. Not the pointer, no. no it's not, not that one, other pointer. No, I'm not you trying to point, I'm trying to change slides. I'll change slides. <coughs> Have I switched this off somehow? Use the arrow key on. Yeah, I'll just use the keyboard. Keep on. Right, okay, so here we are in um, Strangford Lock, which is a, a tidal sea lock, and uh, we've got a sea gen was placed in this narrows at the mouth, but the, uh, the Nendrum Monastery had their tidal mill somewhere in the, uh, in, in the centre of it there. And there is actually, I think, an archaeological site. We've also got, in the UK, we've got a place called Tide Mills in East Sussex, which is a deserted village now, but... Um, and this is the remains of the mill race sluice. On the left, you've got the seaward side, and on the right, the mill pond side. So obviously, they were used for grinding grain. Right, where does tidal energy come from? Well, thanks to the last two speakers, we've had a lot of information about that, and I'm not going to repeat, repeat any of that. But basically, so we've heard how the tide is generated. Um, just restate it that basically, the tide is, is really generated in the deep ocean. Um, by the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun, but it's modified by self-attraction and loading and the dynamical response of the water. So I won't go into all of that at all, but we have got, we are, we are going to hear this, you're going to see this picture again that you've seen once or twice before already. On the shelf, in the, sh in the sh relatively shallow water of our shelf seas, which is less than 200 metres deep, uh, the tides are driven by the forcing from the deep ocean. We don't really need to consider the direct attraction of the of the gravitational attraction effects. And then tides are amplif amplified as they move from the deep ocean in 5,000 metres of water, sorry, I've gone metric, and into shelf, shelf seas 200 metres deep. And then they're dissipated in very shallow waters, less than about 10 metres deep. But in some places, as already mentioned by David, there are these near resonances. The quarter wavelength of the tidal wave matches the distance to the reflecting boundary. That's just saying the geometry works such that the tide gets bigger as it, as it approaches the coast. Um, in the Seven Estuary, I'm not quite sure why I got that there, I wasn't really going to mention this, but anyway, there, you know, there have been studies of all these places and there are some existing um, plants in the world, not built in the Seven, but there's one in Laurence, one in Annapolis Royal in the Bay of Fundy, a small one, one in South Korea, there's a plan in another for a bigger one in South Korea, and the Swansea Bay Lagoon, which um, we thought might have been our first tidal power plant, but wasn't, didn't go ahead in the end. But we have got a couple of places where we've got um, a small number of um, uh, six megawatts of tidal um, stream devices deployed. And then a Hinkley point, this is just for comparison, how much is it going to cost? Um, Hinkley Point has, has had the go-ahead. It could obviously produce a lot of electricity for us. Um, but tidal energy still comes out very expensive. And that is one of the big problems. Oh, and now what's happened there? Where's the rest of my slides gone? I was going to say, I didn't think I was going to show that slide. Right, so we should have gone from... Probably when the point <coughs> went wrong. Back to this... So you've seen this picture before. Yeah, there we go. Right. Okay. So I am I am actually going to try and explain a little bit of it um, because it's really important that um, this is the this is the 
just our biggest tide, the M2 tidal up to the twice daily tide generated by the moon. And as already pointed out, there are a few hot spots around the world, but we do really well. Our tide is coming from the Atlantic, um, and we can't really tell <coughs> very well, but there is, there is a kind of a rim around the North Atlantic where we've got high tides, and that's forcing the tide onto the, onto the shelf. It's probably less clear than the previous version that you saw. Now, what happens with that is that this energy coming from the Atlantic actually propagates across the continental shelf edge to the northwest and to the southwest of the UK. And these numbers are actually from this Professor uh, David Cartwright's work, which you've, you've seen already before, calculated from observations about 190 gigawatts of energy coming across this southwest approaches and 60 gigawatts coming across the northwest approaches. <coughs> And so this is, this is the Bristol Channel here, and there is also a near quarter wave resonance in this area. So this is why we have particularly high tides in the Bristol Channel, but it's also why we have high tides in the Irish Sea, because they actually co-oscillate with this forcing that's, that's putting energy, pushing energy onto the shelf. And there's a little bit of it goes into the North Sea that way, and some of it comes into the North Sea from the North. But actually the West Coast tides for the UK are very high. And this is why we've got an excellent resource. Right, and um, I've actually made calculations from a, from a tidal model which show how the sums add up. And you can actually look and calculate how much energy comes across this shelf edge. This is a, a, a model that's sort of just in the northeast Atlantic. And it's actually from Roger Flanders' model. Um, and then you can see the fluxes of the arrows and the orange colours, the hotter colours, are the tidal dissipation. As a lot of dissipation of energy goes on in the Bristol Channel 7 estuary. And some, quite a lot goes on in uh, Channel Islands and the, the English Channel. Because there's also, this, this resonance actually affects the Channel Islands as well, Bay of St. Marlow, as well as the 7 estuary. So, quite important. How to build a tidal model. Uh, this is what we do for a living. Uh, my colleagues and I at the, at, at, at the National Oceanography Centre. So you take the sea and uh, you divide it up into lots of boxes, which may be various sizes. In this case, it's called an unstructured grid because they're triangular, the boxes. And I'll explain a bit more of that, that in a moment. You have to supply the water depth in each of those boxes. You also have to supply boundary conditions, initial conditions, and external forcing. What that means basically is in order to run tides over our continental shelf, we have to supply the height of the tide at the open boundary, and that's what's pushing the water on and off the continental shelf. And actually we do that by using these harmonic analyses, predictions of tides, taken from satellites and from global models. So, and then we solve the equations of motion back to um, Isaac Newton again. Um, we use a version of the equations that he invented or discovered whichever way you look at it, is mathematics discovery or invention. Anyway, in the form of the Navier-Stokes equations, because that makes already some assumptions. You have to make some assumptions about the behavior of seawater, and its incompressibility, and its viscous fluid, etc. So we, we make some assumptions, and you solve the equations in each box. And we can, if we want to do a global model, we have to apply the tide-generating forces. But otherwise, we assume they're generated, if we're doing a regional model, we assume they're de generated in the deep ocean and then are applied at the boundary. Now, this is actually, if you get zooming in and you want to see what happens when you ha actually build a barrage in your model, this is what you do. You put in some caissons, these black things, and you also put in some tidal turbines. These are the turbines here, which would probably generate electricity going both in and out. And then we have some sluice gates. So we manage the water that comes in and out of an estuary, for example, and we generate power as it goes, we generate electricity as it goes through some turbines. And these are put into certain grid boxes of our model. It allows us to then understand, without building an actual power plant, how that will generate electricity, how much resource you'll get, and how much it'll affect the local environment, This is, which is a very important issue. Right, um, so now this is, I thought, really interesting. I only discovered this this week. But in a global model, you'd think, all right, well, do we know the depth of the water everywhere in the world? More or less, we, we actually have excellent um, knowledge of the bathymetry of the oceans 
from a, 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 a Jebco um, atlas, which is actually uh, contributed to with the National Oceanography Centre and the British Oceanographic Data Centre actually work on this. And you, get, you use the depth in all of those grid points and you get a tide and it actually looks quite reasonable. But there's a strange thing going on down here in the Weddell Sea. Now this is a more recent model that has been built where they've used a bit more data which is under the sea ice on the ice shelves of, of, of um, Antarctica. And look, lo and behold, this strange phenomenon here of a very high tide in the Weddell Sea has gone away. And the other thing that's happened is if, if you look at our North Atlantic tides, they've actually gone down a bit. And that these on the right are a bit more accurate. So even very recently, we're getting the better answers by improving the data that we have for our models. Right, so 10 years ago we did a project where we looked particularly at how we could generate electricity from barrages in the Eastern Irish Sea. And we also looked at the Seven Estuary. And we built a model with lots of triangles which went down to a resolution of about 50 metres in some of the estuaries. This is the, this is the, uh, the D estuary. You can see how the resolution gets really high as you get into the coast. And we made some calculations, assuming you built a barrage like the La Rance. Right, so... Well, we got some answers out, and this is how we use the numerical models for this tidal resource and impact estimation. We can use different kinds of models. A 0D model is actually just calculating how the energy goes across this impoundment. This, so we've got our tidal barrage here, for example. We've got high water at one side, and we've got low water at the other. And as the water flows through the turbine, it turns the turbine. That's the basic principle. And, and a lot of this work was done by a colleague who was a, my supervisor for a long time when I first started, Dave Frandall, and he looked at how you could generate on both the ebb tide only, where you let the water come into the estuary, shut the gates, the sluices, and then generate only as the water goes out, or you can generate on both the in and out, two-way generation on both flood and ebb tide. And you get a difference in height inside the uh, estuary in the water level compared to the undisturbed tide. So this solid line here is, is our undisturbed tide and the dotted line is how it would look inside the estuary after you... So you've made a big change in the water level inside an estuary and that's one of the big problems. If you actually run it on a two-way generation, you, you get a less of a disturbance. You get a bit of a timing change and a slightly less height inside the estuary. But what would you think if we closed off the Mersey or the D? Generating tidal electricity, yes, but your estuary wouldn't look the same anymore at all. So if it was actually generating on the ebb, which is the most efficient way to generate tidal electricity, you would be having an estuary that was full of water most of the time. So instead of at Liverpool having that really bare expanse of tidal, intertidal habitat, we would have water most of the time. Might be handy for shipping. But there are other issues. You have to cross through the barrage. You have to have ship locks. So there are lots of issues about how to, how to run this. So we want to know a bit more about than just how to make the water flow through the turbine. And then we start looking at a 1D model where we could average over the cross section of the river. And a 2D model, usually depth average. We, a lot of work's been done with 2D models, depth average often in global models. But really what we want to know is 3D model wave. You have the whole information about the water column as well. You can actually allow look at the effects of salinity in the river and sediments in the estuaries, which is very important. I'm not going to dwell on this much further. But global versus regional models, as I said, we have the global models with tide generating forces. Regional models, we only need to provide the mouth. And, and then we need to take the boundary sufficiently far offshore that we don't have any interference with this resonant effect. So resonant effects are the same. Could be the Bristol Channel, Channel Islands, Bay of Fundy, Hudson's Bay. Yep, where about one? Right, global resources. Where This is actually just tidal stream. A few places around the world have quite good tidal resources. Let's just look at the UK. This is our tidal range resource on the left. This is where the tides are the highest. Obviously, Seven Estuary, obviously Liverpool also Channel Islands, and a bit of the uh, English Channel. If we look at tidal stream, this is where the flows are really fast around headlands or through straits. Our highest resource, as many people might know, is through the Pentland Firth between the mainland of Scotland and the Orkney Islands. But there are other places, uh, like around Anglesey, that's a good place. But again, around headlands um, in, in South Wales or around Channel Islands again. 
Um, and this chap, David Mackay, who did this sustainable energy without the hot air, very useful book to read about sort of deep debunking myths, um, showed where we could possibly put barrages or also coastal lagoons like what Swansea Bay, like uh, some parts of the North Wales coast. We built a model, and this is uh, showing you some of our latest work. We built a model of the whole UK shelf, and um, it was done for the Scottish government, actually. They wanted to know about marine renewed, renewable energy resources and also aquaculture. So in 2013, we were building this model, and some of the recent results that we got from it are from putting tidal turbines in, in a, a really high density in the Pentland Firth to see how much electricity we could generate. The number of turbines that we put in here is 2,800. This is huge. Um, we said we would only put them in a minimum depth of 27 meters because you have to allow um, sufficient clearance above them. And the tidal turbine that we're looking at is a, a sort of idealized generic turbine, about 15 meters, with a 10 meter um, blade uh, diameter. And a certain capacity factor is assumed, minimum spacing between them. You get as many as you can realistically get in there and then we looked at how that could generate electricity. But there's another issue. This is, this is how, how sustainable. What are we doing to the sea if we take so much energy out of it? So how will they behave? Um, and if we have th effects like sediment transport and habitats and ecology, how will they be affected? And there may be la long-term <coughs> large changes in the tidal distribution and the system itself. But there are also likely to be very large changes in the, in the sediment patterns in estuaries if you, if you build these things. So um, we looked at the Mersey in particular. And this is just looking at um, if you put in, this is the undisturbed spring tide here. And this is the mud flats in green when it's uh, low water and when it's high water. And this is how they would change if you put in an ebb mode spring tide barrage. And the barrage would be about here, and how the low water and the high water um, extent of intertidal habitat would change. And um, so it would reduce the habitats. And this is really important for feeding birds. We have extremely important estuaries around. In fact, most estuaries in the world are protected in some way. They're very important for, um, for bird feeding or other, other activities and, and very productive, um, ecologically speaking. So, can we afford to change it to such an extent? One of the things we can do, which we explored in our paper, was if you put in a, um, if you look at the undisturbed level, um, let's just pick the Mersey, it's as black as the undisturbed, and then if you put in a, the original plan was for an ebb mode barrage, that's the gray, dark gray, and then if we looked at one where you put in lots more tidal turbines and you also ran it on both uh, two-way, in other words, flood and ebb, you would actually retain more of the intertidal habitat. So it is one way of protecting it, but it's a way of increasing the cost of your energy as well. So the summary of that project that we did recently is we ran this model over a year and we looked at how to take energy out. We looked at two things, though. We were, it's important to consider, one, how much, how much we're changing the pattern of the tides around the UK. Um, and so we looked at... Um, at the tidal range and how that might change. On the left is the undisturbed range, and on the right is when you put lots of energy devices in the in Scottish waters, and you will change the tidal range a bit around the UK. And this is how it would change um, the currents. Little bits of change in the current. Lots of the, lots of it's local to the Pentland Firth where you change the currents. Um, and we also looked at how you can combine what we think is going to be the climate change effects on these things and also the energy extraction. So which one is more important? We're trying to put, use tidal energy in order to reduce our climate impacts that we're doing, what we're doing to the, the planet. Um, it turns out that climate change and energy, tidal energy extraction both act in the same way in some cases uh, for increasing stratification, but the changes due to the climate change effect are an order of magnitude larger than what we would do if we actually extracted energy on the largest scale we could imagine. I've got to say, these are idealized, idealized scenarios because we have no plans at this point to put 3,000 tidal turbines in the Pentland Firth. Um, so there are some tidal turbines out there. 
There's actually a plan for the Pentland Firth, but in May Gen are putting them out there in the inner sound. They've actually got four turbines there, about six gigawatts. And here we've got another new device that's considered, a, it's a tidal kite, or it looks like an aeroplane, which actually flies around the flow. And actually this has been commissioned at the Hollyhead Deep, off the coast of North Wales. So there are some very small amounts of tidal energy being, tidal electricity being generated. And there's some pros and cons of using our models, that we believe in the models if we can validate them. People would say, oh, this is just a model, but actually we do want to test our models and make sure that they're doing sensible things. The th good thing about it is we can test scenarios before any installation is built. Um, and so we don't have to actually go and spend billions of pounds uh, actually installing to see what's going to happen. Um, we have the sensitivity to different parameters in the model. We won't go into the detail, but you know there are things which we can change in the model. Um, bottom friction is a big, big question about how that behaves in a model. Um, and it can be used to interpret and interpolate and extrapolate from sparse observations. Even with satellites, we still don't get enough data in the actual direct observation of the sea. So we, we think this is a good tool to use. Challenges for the UK, this is my final slide, is that we have this Climate Change and, um, Act and the Renewables Obligation. We need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and increase the production of renewable energy. Electricity is on track, but heat and transport are falling behind. And tidal energy could possibly produce up to 20% of the present UK electricity demand. And how much of that could be obtained from tidal stream and from lagoons and uh, barrages is another question. How to deal with the intermittency of all these renewable resources because we've got the spring leap cycle. They don't always get the full amount of the potential that we could get if it's spring tide. Then we've got the neap tides and we're going to get a lot less electricity during those times. So we need things like energy storage and uh, to look at other options anyway to, to combine with it. The final option, the final obstacles, I would just say, I'm just going to state, I'm not going to go into, but the upfront costs, it's a lot of money. It's still expensive electricity. It's a real challenge to get down to the order of 57 um, pounds per kilowatt hour, megawatt hour that we pay for offshore wind. That is a very, very good figure now. Um, uh, but there are also environmental impacts. And we have to, you know, obviously take account of the, what is the urgency of this need to decarbonise? This is, a, again, political and, and, and um, the, the public will to actually pay more for electricity. So, that's all I've got to tell you. Thank you.